Hey, Carl Spacers, welcome to one of my personal favorite uh, storylines of all time with Spider-Man and JR. This is one of your favorites also with the death of Gene DeWolf? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, just to let everybody know, I was not taking my Metamucil. I had not <laughs> fallen asleep, nor did I run out of Baja Blast Mountain Dew. Well, no, no, no. It's it's a, It's been a full month. It's February oh, now, that's, JR. That's, that's it's right. February. It's, 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 so. it's been a month. Uh, yes, actually it is. And um, I, I remember uh, when this story came out, because this was during one of those periods I wasn't buying every Spider-Man comic. Uh, and this was at the very end of my college days uh and i was um, 10 uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was a brilliant kid i was in college but uh or are you saying you were 10 at that time i, I was 10 yes you were 10 okay yeah i was uh, 85 yeah i was a senior at college in college at university wasn't buying all the the spider-man titles except you know i pe picked and choose picked and chose and so i was in the drugstore uh and i saw this one i just leafed through it it was part four and oh, you then saw, I saw the last the, chapter first oh, okay. the last chapter and the story in the last i have you know and it's like i grabbed it it's like this is this is awesome this is just awesome uh it was awesome in 1985 and it's still very good now um i, I picked it, it, it up off the spinner rack back in 85 yeah. so and then all four I, they had all four and then when i rebuilt my collection i went made sure i got the first three uh another reason i like the uh, this story actually more recently was uh uh when uh, I was getting the kids Christmas gifts, I think, I think I guess this is not this Christmas or last Christmas. And Spencer wanted me to find the, uh, the death of Gene DeWolf and uh, the, the graphic novel. Right. Uh, and because he wanted to give it for, to write to my daughter, to Rachel. Uh, and uh, he, uh, his explanation was, well, he wanted to give it to Rachel because he thought it was a mix of Spider-Man and law and order. Oh yeah. Uh, and um, well, that was, that was the, uh, the orders. They wanted all the titles to feel a little bit different. Amazing. Big things happen. Mm -hmm. Web he's on the road. Spec is like law and order detective mm -hmm. crime and gritty stuff. Yeah. yeah. And like the credits at the end, but oh, it would be like uh, for a while there were black with white lettering and it was meant yeah. to be uh, I think Hill street blues, I think was uh, it was supposed to be something like that, but, it, but no, it was uh, it definitely, yeah, it was definitely must be, supposed to be more down to earth noir whatever and and uh, of course you know with peter david too peter david uh is probably one of the uh the greatest spider -Man. i think i can comfortably say he's one of the greatest spider man my writers. personal favorites it's uh, funny you should mention him because i want it before we start this episode i want to get, make mm -hmm. people aware peter david has a gofundme he's been sick for the last year uh and health insurance is not cheap if you would like to support peter david Log on to the GoFundMe.com slash Peter, Peter dash David dash fund. And or actually it's a hyphen, not a dash Peter hyphen David hyphen fund. And uh, you can help uh, Peter David with some huge medical bills. He's on dialysis at the moment is what the latest update said right here as of yesterday. So uh, he's doing better, but it's been a year and a half of hell for him. So yeah. he's one of my favorites, one of JR's favorites. Mm -hmm. He's been on the crawl space several times. In fact, he was the very first celebrity mm -hmm. on the crawl space uh, for the podcast. So if you'd like to check him out uh, and help him out, his wife and friends are organizing a GoFundMe. And uh, if you've liked the story, go like that, that uh, page. So much yeah. prayers, thoughts, good wishes to our friend, Peter David friend of the show one of all one of our all-time favorites yeah and uh he was probably the uh, also the the best spider-man uh, spider-man star trek comic book writer oh yeah you uh, know what i'm i'm actually i'm on a, a did you ever read the star trek novels that he wrote I, uh i stopped reading very early well i, I think i read like the first 20 or 30 and yeah. they were so some of them were so bad uh, oh, but I, I like them a lot. I like. I hear they got they got. From what I understand, they got better with with the editorial control. He, but uh, we always talk Star Trek. But I'm gonna. Uh, I got a new iPad, and I've been reading uh, Star Trek: New Frontier, which is original yeah. creation that New Frontier uh, Peter David created, and was strictly novels. So I read them years ago, and I'm rereading them, and they're still just as awesome as they are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 it's just a shame that he didn't get a run on a title that wasn't interrupted by idiotic events and things. I mean, I guess he was spectacular was, but yeah, he didn't get, he, he should have been, he should have been on Spider-Man for as long as he was on Hulk. You know, he should have had a good hundred issue run where he could do arcs and stuff of his own. But anyway, so to the death of Gene DeWolf, death of Gene DeWolf. Now, first spec of all, one, real quick, spec 107 to 110, if you're looking for where this is located. And who's the artist on this, Brad? I, Rich, uh, Rich Butler. 
I, I love this art. I mean, uh, I do too. Uh, it's just, it, it's just, it's, it's just good and solid. He's not doing anything fancy. He's not making everybody ugly. You know, he's not, they don't have, you know, they look like people, you know, yep, it's absolutely. But anyway, uh, start Gene DeWolf. Who was Gene DeWolf? Uh, Gene DeWolf was created by the legendary, well, and the underappreciated Bill Mantlo mm -hmm. uh, for uh, Marvel team up number 48 in, back in the 1970s. Uh, and at that time, uh, actually she was the reason she was in it is she was one of the, uh, she was the sister and, and daughter of the villains. Um, her thought she was a police captain. And again, this is the seventies folks. So, I mean, that was a female police captain, but her father had been a cop and he resented the fact that she was, he didn't think a woman should have been a cop or a police captain. You know, she had a brother who was a cop. That's who the dad thought should have been the police captain. But the brother uh, was shot uh, in the spine or neck or whatever, and was, was comatose. Uh, and as it turned out, the father had psychic powers and was using him to do all kinds of, of mischief. And his name was the Wraith. Um, uh, so, um, so that was a story. It was actually a pretty good story. It was, I mean, one of the few early Marvel team up stories. It was a four part story. Yeah. Uh, and it was fairly good. Um, and, um, Jean, you know, she made minor, you know, minor appearance in MTU 61, I think. And, but then, and, and, and I think I'm right, but I'm sure that somebody out there could correct me if I'm wrong, but she really didn't start becoming a supporting character until I believe Roger Stern's run on Spectacular, because yeah. I believe, and this was like, I think in the forties, fifties, sixties, of uh, Spectacular early eighties. Yeah. Okay. Because, um, uh, Stern, you know, Thank made you. the observation that, you know, Spider-Man swings all around the city. So he's always going to several, you know, he's always going to these different police precincts. And it's like, shouldn't he be, if he's in a certain area of town, shouldn't he be running into one different captains throughout the city? But when he goes to a particular precinct, shouldn't he keep running into the particular captains? Yeah. So, you know, Gene was one, uh, Chris Keating, <laughs> as we turned out, was not Chris Keating, I guess, ultimately, uh, detective Wait, Sergeant Snyder, um, refresh oh. me for Keating. It's not ringing a bell. Who is that? Well, Chris Keating was, he was, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it, it, Spire, Spidey had different relationships with each of these, uh, each captains, you know, Gene secretly really liked him, but was always kind of giving him a hard time. Detective Sergeant Snyder was kind of the same way he respected him, but, you know, uh, but Keating couldn't, Keating didn't have any use for him at all. Keating couldn't stick. Keating was an old school SWAT guy. He didn't have any use for Spider-Man at all. The problem, <laughs> but then later we find out that Keating was really the foreigner in disguise. Oh, now, okay. now I, I don't know if like, you know, he replaced the real Keating or if he had always been Chris Keating, I, I don't know, yeah. but it turned out that, which I, I thought was a shame. I mean, because it was a, you know, a decent character, but anyway, so, so Jean started to become more of a supporting character. Then Bill Mantlo came back to the title and she really was, I mean, she was in it a lot. Um, and, uh, she, uh, started, started developing some feelings for Spider-Man that she was keeping under wraps. Um, this was when he was, his, his, his relationship with the black cat was really heating up. I mean, really, this is right after the, um, uh, the Doc Ock, uh, the, that great series with Doc Ock in the, uh, by the way, that's being reprinted. Finally, Marvel masterworks. Finally. Yeah. 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 Uh, get it folks. It's, it's, yeah. it's worth it. It's, it's, yeah. uh. I don't know how many issues are going to be in it, but I remember, I think that the store is that throughout, it was like 10 issues. There were a couple of issues that didn't deal specifically with that. But anyway, it's a great story, folks. Uh, make sure, it's always been in my top 10. Yeah. Uh, Spider-Man rips off all of Otto's arms at the same time. Yeah. So it's great. Sorry. So anyway, but Gene started, you know, I mean, developing and, you know, it looked like it was going somewhere, but then uh, I guess Peter David was told to shake up. They needed to shake up the titles mm -hmm. and this was his answer to shaking it up. But anyway, so anyway, the first few pages, it goes through Gene's story, uh, but definitely Peter David has taken a little different spin on it. Basically he introduces a stepfather we never heard of. He pretty well dismisses the biological father and the brother who actually were very major players in Jean's first story. Uh, but so she, he, he gives her this stepfather who that's who she was trying to please, you know, and then her mother, you know, was always, you know, who, who, who was always afraid that he was not going to come home one day. And he got, then she got even madder at, 
her uh, stepfather because Gene wanted to become a cop following in his footsteps. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the story. So Gene is going through all of this. And then we realize on about page three that what's happening is her life is flashing before her eyes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the neighbors call after hearing some noises and, you know, and then they come and find out that she's she's taking a double barrel shotgun through the chest. Um, so, you know, it's it's one of those, you know, if it were a lot, literally, if it were a law and order episode, you would see oh. this would be the preamble yeah. and they would find they would, you know, and then like Jerry Orbach and uh, Jesse Martin, which, you know, Jerry Orbach, the great Jerry Orbach, yeah, I like him. Uh, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know what he would say, but he would have something both witty, sardonic and tragic to say. And then you'd go to the credits, credits. And, then, dum, dum. Yeah, and then like the story reopens in a completely different, you know, it's, it's, Boom. Peter Parker. yeah, it's Peter Parker taking pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and that's kind of one of the hallmarks of a great story, you know, which is also, again, the artist has to have credit, get the artist gets credit too. If you can see a story in another medium, for example, that's a good story. You know, it's like, boy, I would like to see this, you know, as a TV show, a two part TV show or something. So, anyway, uh, Peter runs into Ernie, Ernie Popchick, who is at this time, Aunt May was running a halfway house for senior citizens, you know, which I guess is, you know, oh, Crips get out of the hospital. or I don't know. I don't know what a halfway house, I guess I'm going to find out one of these days, aren't I? No, uh, a halfway house. I don't think they have them anymore. I think they're more senior citizen living complexes yeah. or AK but, nursing homes. Well, I, I was trying, I mean, to me, a halfway house, I mean, from what I always heard of it in the context of like, you know, a substance abuse, you know, uh, where, where yeah, but in Aunt May's case, it's more like old people. Yeah, but it's kind of like, well, why aren't they, you know, why are probably, you know, the thing is, it was probably, I would probably say it was private independent living, you know, because I always understood a halfway house to be like, if you're getting out of prison or you're getting out of a drug rehab program, you're not quite ready to be on your own, but you're also not, um, you're also not, you know, invalid or whatever. But anyway, so essentially Aunt May is running an independent, but probably the reason she quit was because since it was a private independent living, she couldn't get Medicare funding. <laughs> so that's probably why she doesn't do it anymore. Um, Cause you can't do that. You can't do that anymore. Um, very, very few. Pro anyway, so Peter's with Ernie pop chick and you know, they're just talking boo -boo, and Pete, you know, Peter, of course, being the young guy turns his head, starts walking a little faster and Ernie gets mugged. And uh, these guys are beating on this poor old man. And of course, you know, you know, Peter, you know, catches them and they, they, they run away. And Peter says, you know, call, get help. And someone says, are you going for the cop, going to get to call the cops? And, you know, the, just, I, again, I just love it. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know what it is when a story, when a story grabs you in and sucks you in, you start liking everything about it. And like just the panel where Peter's pulling, ripping his jacket off, you know, are you calling the cops? And he's going, not exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pulling a Superman there. Yeah. I mean, it's just a uh, Spider-Man's coming to save the day. And he, and he's just, he's really mad. You know, but obviously Spider-Man doesn't want to kill people or, or, you know, damage them too badly, but he comes up with these great lines, you know, it's like, oh, hey guys, I won't, uh, I won't move. Take a shot at me. Well, he jumps and they say, hey, you said you wouldn't move. I lied. <laughs> you know, to quote Arnold in, in, in Commando. Uh, <laughs> and one guy says, I'm surrendering. You can't hit me. You wouldn't dare hit me. Oh, I was hoping you'd say it. <laughs> So pow, right yeah, this pow. so you know, of course, he gets deposited right on the cop's doorstep, basically. You know, and 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 the guy says, "Oh, I want him arrested. He used excessive force." You know, inspire Moi? Uh, <laughs> uh, and and the cop and the cop says, ah, "Too bad. There's no witnesses. No witnesses." Um, Here, let me show you the moi. There's the moi. Yeah, it's like nice. That's he cute. did a moi. <laughs> I would uh, never excessively. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I can see Andrew Garfield delivering that line. You know, I, um, real quick, that's been a question in chat. Um, they say that, uh, this should be adapted. Um, I think an Andrew Garfield, I think a 30 year old Spider-Man can do is I don't, I think Tom Holland's too young for this story. Yeah. You know, I would always, I was thinking I, you know, before, actually, before we came on the air, I was thinking that because I, 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 I don't like, I mean, you know, I, Dr. Strange, uh, Dr. Strange was, was more of a plot device 
so he wasn't really in the way in No Way Home. Uh, but, uh, you know, usually I like just to see Spider-Man in a Spider-Man movie, but I would like to see a Spider-Man Daredevil movie. I really would. Well, with Char- you might with be Char- getting it. That's With that's Charlie rumor. Cox. But, uh, of course, Charlie's not been, you know, they've not been treating Daredevil too well lately. With, uh, I haven't seen she, Echo yet. Uh, I've heard the, I, he's in it briefly, but I, I, I've heard the fight scene is awful. But anyway, but, you know, they scrapped Daredevil Reborn or Born Again, or was it Reborn? After like filming eight 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 uh, episodes because it was so bad. Well, I'm uh, glad that they did because I don't want to mess up Daredevil. Yeah, I am. love Daredevil. Uh, but anyway, but yeah, I, I, to the cop. Sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I agree with you. Andrew Garfield, I think, would be a a much better Spider-Man to uh, team up with Daredevil. But anyway, so you know, he and the cop are you know just exchanging pleasantries, and he said, "Hey, did you hear about Gene?" Of course, you know, hey, <laughs> is this a joke about Gene and the Miami Dolphins? Uh, but no. And it's, it's Gene's been, Gene's been murdered. Uh, then the scene shifts to uh, somebody giving a confession to a priest, you know, and uh, is this our murderer? Is this our murderer? You know, could be, you never know. <laughs> uh, but then there's actually, again, uh, another, there's a scene with uh, Robbie and uh, Jonah, which is a very good scene. Uh, Peter David wrote Jonah very well yeah. uh, because, you know, because you know Jonah is he's obnoxious he's a blowhard uh he's got to hang up about Spider-Man you know Spider-Man just gets under his skin because in a, in a way Spider-Man's a hero that he can't be but so Spider-Man is kind of his personal devil but at the core Jonah is a decent moral man with integrity you know but he he says hang up about Spider-Man but you know and Robbie basically gets him to it you know Jonah basically, you know, uh, Robbie says, I didn't think you liked Jean because Jonah pays her some respect. So she was a good cop, you know? Well, yeah, I didn't like her, but that mean I want her killed. Uh, yeah, I didn't like JFK either, but I didn't want to see him get killed. <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, so, you know, and then, then Robbie asking, well, what do you think? Does Spider-Man deserve to die? You know, and then <laughs> Jonah, eh, Hitler deserved to die, you know, blah, blah. But Spider-Man's not one of those. <laughs> so anyway so so anyway and then spider-man goes to see uh goes to the police station uh because he wants to uh talk with the cop who's running the investigation into gene's death and he's told that it's stan carter so he finds stan carter and they start having a nice chat and you know it, it's like <laughs> it's like yeah it's like when you see a significant guest star on a TV show or like you're watching a movie and yeah. then an actor comes on oh. who, who is in a, who, who deliver, who, who's, who's, and I always use the example of Craig T. Nelson in Turner and Hooch. He, co- <laughs> the character come because you see there's a murder, you know, and uh, Craig T. Nelson shows up as the police chief, but he doesn't really say anything of any merit, you know, but you've got an actor who is clearly larger than whatever scene he's doing, you know, and it's like, hey, that's Craig T. Nelson. He must be the bad guy. He must guy. be the bad guy. He wouldn't take a part lower than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like <laughs> because, because they wouldn't put him in this part just to be a supporting, you know. Yeah. Uh so and you know, Stan comes across as as a nice, decent guy. For you a know? Sec. And, I didn't expect a Turner and Hooch reference in the chat of Gene DeWolf. That's what you get on Spider History. You get yeah, you get, yeah pop, you get all kinds. But it's but it is. It's just funny. It's like yeah. oh, there's so you just know this guy's the bad guy. You right. know he is. Uh, but um, you know, but uh, so you know he and Spider Man do a little you know a little fencing or whatever. But it's 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 clear that that Carter respects him, uh, and uh, you know, and he tells uh, Spider Man that uh, you know one of the reasons I'm talking to you, even bothering to talk to you though, is that. Uh, you know, Jean, uh, but they were talking about how Jean was always dour and never smiled. You know, I, I, she was a beautiful woman there and never smiled. But uh, but she even liked you, Web Slinger, which is why partly I'm even talking to you. She always she spoke very highly of you, of course, which will play later in a later scene. But but, yeah, we knew that Jean respected and liked Spider-Man, even though she, she didn't have much. She, she he drove her crazy uh, with his, you know, flout in the law and, and other things like that. But also she, you know, I'm sure she always felt grateful to him for, uh, you know, helping her brother out uh, help, uh, back in the uh, again, Marvel team up 48 to 51. It's uh, you can probably find it somewhere. 
uh, you know, Marvel, uh, the, the, the Marvel essentials Unlimited. or whatever. So, yep. but anyway, so, you know, and Spider-Man says, well, you know, I, she, I don't know, she always was given, she was always, you know, uh, chewing my ass out, but you know, I kind of liked her too. Um, anyway, Jean was a good character. Jean, I, I just, you know, she was, so then the scene goes to Daredevil and Daredevil is, um, you know, hurrying to court because he happens to be the attorney for the guys who, or at least the, the, the attorney for the arraignment or the arraignment. Uh, I don't know that he would necessarily have been their defense attorney, but anyway, he shows up, he's the attorney for the arraignment and he gets them off on bail. Well, you know, <laughs> Peter obviously to support Mr. Popchick, Aunt May is there and Peter is there and Peter is not happy in the slightest that they got bail. And so he like literally goes up to Murdoch and starts, you know, letting Murdoch have it. And of course, Matt never forgets a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, boom, boom, boom. That's Spider-Man. <laughs> and of course, Aunt May just absolutely gives it away. Um, you know, by addressing him, Peter, by his name, <laughs> uh, you know, because he's chewing out a blind man. He's yelling at a blind man. And no, obviously nobody knows he's Daredevil. You Shame know? on you, Peter Parker. Yeah. It's like, so, but you know, but Matt, you know, he's, it, it's like, you know, Matt is a lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, it, it's like he, and of course he, and he's an, a moral one. So he, he has a, uh, he sometimes has conflicts with, you know, what is justice and what is the law and what is just right, the right thing to do. And sometimes they don't always intersect. So he's having a crisis, a kind of a crisis of confidence, you know, and he's talking with an old judge friend of his. Uh, but then we see the killer, whoever it was, the killer show up. We know he's the killer because he's got a double barrel shotgun and he's wearing a green mask. So we know he's the bad guy and he tries to take out Murdoch. Um and of course, you know, you, you, you know, you don't just sneak up behind daredevil and, and blow him away. Uh, so actually Matt's holding his own, but unfortunately his judge friend walks back in that time and the sin eater, uh, we don't know he's a sin eater. I, I think, well, he does call himself that, but, uh, so we know he's a sin eater. Sin eater blows the judge away in the last panel. Oof. Again, it's like this, uh, this story, this again, you know, it's like it had a great cliffhanger. I mean, this story has great oh, cliffhangers. Part three, especially great cliffhangers. Uh, and it's, and it's what you used to see in comic books too. You know, they want, you, they want you to buy the next one. Well, yeah, I mean, but you used to see great cliffhanger where you wanted to buy the next one. I mean, here, here, and that's the difference again, between today's comics. Frankly, you don't care if you see the next one. I mean, how often are we talking about like, you know, well, I'm going to read the rest of the story because I'm kind of committed to it, but you know, how often, you, well, I, I can remember the clip. Uh, uh, the current most, um, as we record this, the cliffhanger of Amazing Spider-Man this month is we have all the villains in Central Park fighting each other for Amazing Spider-Man, for the gang war. Remember, they're on one side. Yeah, I know. But yeah. that, like, what happens to Spider-Man? Well, that doesn't do, you know, and it's like, of course, I'm sitting there wondering, where are the cops? Why are they letting all these people line up? You know, I mean, a gang war. Uh, they, they think it's a, a rumble or, or what do they or, call it? Yeah. Or they think they're a bunch of LARPers or something, you know, yeah, role players or whatever. Players, um, yeah. But no, okay. I mean, it's just so, so you get a great cliffhanger. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to issue 108 and we're kind of, uh, you know, there's a flashback to when Murdoch first met this judge. Uh, and then we go to uh, page two um, where, where we see the judge has obviously been murdered. Page three is when Matt decides to go after the guy. He's going to find some place to change the daredevil and he's going to go after the guy. Uh, but there's a little Easter egg folks on page three. Um, there's a guy reading a newspaper. Uh, if you can find it. Gotcha. There it is. Well, most people, who is that everybody? <laughs> I, these people watching may be too young, but that's Charles Bronson. That is Charles death wish. The death wish movies, death yeah. wish. Oh, horn a sec. You got it. You got yeah. it. Yeah, uh, uh, Bronson was uh, the Death Wish movie was uh, 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 the, the, that was one of the first, I believe, vigilante movies. Uh, the seventies, um, the seventies were kind of the uh, 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 um, uh, a good time for the uh, vigilante. Uh, That's where genre. the Punisher came from. 
Punisher yeah, the Punisher. The pu yeah, well, yeah, the Punisher was based on a a, a book uh, and a character called The Executioner, written by Don Pendleton. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I used to, I, I I had like the first fifty of those books. Oh, wow. uh, I I read a lot of those Executioner books. I know guys, uh, you know, a bleeding heart like me, you'd be surprised reading about a guy who exacts vengeance by killing everybody he can. But uh, I uh, I'm confessing I've never seen Death Wish, Jr. I'm sorry. There's like five of them too. Yeah, there's five of them. Uh, there, there's only two good ones. Yeah. Um, I, like, yes, Adam, I did see Dirty Harry. I love, I've seen all the Dirty Harrys. I like Yeah, that. Dirty Harry's not really a vigilante, though. Dirty Dirty Harry's a cop and, you know, will cross the line sometimes. But uh, Bronson was a, uh, to make this short, he was an architect whose family got attacked. His daughter was raped and hospitalized and his wife was murdered. Uh, so he decided to, uh, you know, take law on his own hands. Uh, but the thing was, though, it was originally supposed to be uh, Jack Lemon in the part and Harry, Henry Fonda is a detective and they changed it. And the, the off the writer of the book, it was based on hated it because he said, you know, when you see Charles Bronson, you know, he's going to shoot somebody. <laughs> so anyway, not, you know, yeah. Charles, but number three was good because it's just kind of a cartoon death wish. Um, you know, a cartoony version with a lot of great lines and snarky lines. Uh, two, four, and five are, are you know, worthless. They're just anyway. Anyway, well, you oh, know, I, I'm giving blam. you, a, I'm giving you people pop culture lessons too. Okay, okay. Anyway, yep. so the um, because that's where I mean, I mean, because I mean, writers are always referencing these pop culture. Anyway, so Spider Man, you know, the Sin Eaters run out. Spider Man, uh, Peter changes to Spider Man and confronts the Sin Eater. Unfortunately. You know, when you're dealing with a madman with a double barrel shotgun, you know, and, you know, he takes a shot at you. He takes a shot at a guy who moves too fast, really, to be shot for the most part. People are going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, and so Spider-Man gets thrown off his game a little bit. Uh, but because of that, and also because the Sin Eater, this, this Sin Eater guy, he's awfully strong, stronger than your normal thug should be so, but you know, Spider-Man finally starts getting the upper hand. Uh, and then he sees that Aunt May is down on the street and he doesn't know, has she been, was she shot? You know, uh, how badly is she hurt? So, you know, basically he, you know, and he can't, he's run out of webbing. How convenient he runs out of webbing, <laughs> um, tries to hit the scene eater with a, um, spider tracer, but <laughs> pretty obvious. So, you know, the San Diego pulls it off, but turns out Aunt May was just kind of knocked down. You know, she's okay. Uh, and um, of course, and again, this is the, one of the Ernie pop chicken, you know, this is one of the usual people around Aunt May who are always criticizing people, Peter for never being there. You know, it's like your aunt, you should have been at your aunt's side. You know, it's uh I don't know, but, but at this point in time, Aunt May, the original Aunt May, I should say, yeah. um, you know, should have, I think at this time, Aunt May knew that Peter was Spider-Man because it was always, um, I believe, uh, whoever, I, I believe it was kind of generally accepted that an issue Amazing 200, she began to accept the fact that Peter was Spider-Man. She just didn't tell him until the JMS era. Um, and of course, then it was all wiped away, which is was stupid, stupid, stupid. Anyway, so Daredevil gets there. Senior year's gone. He got there too late because he took too long to to change into Spider Man. I mean, to change into Daredevil. Uh, so Spider Man decides to uh, go visit Stan Carter again. Uh, and um, you mean Craig T. Nelson? As you yeah, <laughs> well, now, this yeah, it's his version of Craig T. Nelson. <laughs> you know. And, well, yeah. Uh, is, do you think Craig T. Nelson can play Stan Carter? Who do you like? Oh, well, he could have at one time. Yeah, yeah he could. Yeah, you know, definitely. I mean, and, and yeah, and Craig T. Nelson is a likable enough guy. You know, I mean, uh, you know, he he would have. Uh, uh, I'm never going to get him out of my head now. I, he's going to be Stan Carter. You know, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. you know, so so they talk. You know, and uh, and, and we smokes. find, but we find people out that so people that smoke even in the 80s, they're like, yeah, there's something about you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, everybody, Jean smoked. I mean, well, that's, was, true. Uh, that's yeah, Jean, true. Uh, in fact, it, she kind of tapered off near the end, but Jean was a chain smoker. I mean, that was, uh, uh, in, in fact, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, uh, she always had a cigarette in her mouth when the Marvel <laughs> team up and, uh, but everybody smoked until, oh, until they, about the eighties. Uh, um, true. but, uh, you were know, you, then, were you on a, were you on an airplane where, when they smoked? I was when I was a kid. Um, I, yes. Um, weird, isn't uh, it? To think of now. It, yeah, it was, uh, but I was always, I was like in the non-smoking section, but yeah, you could still, that. You which could doesn't mean anything. It. It's just, it's yeah. air. <laughs> you, you, could, you could still smell the Absolutely. smoke. Absolutely. 
Uh, and it's like, you know, you just, but people did it. Everybody smoked. Yes, and then, you know, did. and then like I later did. you think, holy shit, we're flying in a tin can full of gasoline. I know, I mean, I know right. <laughs> uh, you know, and I mean, uh, you really have no idea how much fuel the these big one, these big ones carry. I mean, oh, they really man. do because like the world trade center is an example. I mean, one plane, one plane with its fuel and sorry, folks, there's no government conspiracy. One plane with the fuel burned, you know, caused it to collapse. But anyway, so Stan and Peter or Spider-Man are exchanging notes and talking and things. And then we find out a couple of things about Stan Carter. We find out that one, he was an agent of shield. And we find out too that his partner was killed six months ago. Mm-hmm. Now the thing is, this was slightly re- well. Th- there was another twist put on this when the Sin Eater took away Norman Osborn's sins, but that's story later. But anyway, so we find out these two things about Stan Carter, and then this weird old guy with the glasses goes to the same priest to confess some sins. All right. Now, and 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 next is. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of a, it, it's one of those scenes. It's, it's kind of a heartbreaking scene. And uh, it's one that really makes you realize, God, you know, that it was that another missed opportunity. Spider-Man decides to, and I don't know why he's never been a detective, you know, but somehow he thinks he can go into Gene's apartment and his spider sense will clue him into something and that he'll find something that the cops did. So, so anyway, so Spider-Man is, uh, you know, going through her apartment and he comes across this stash of pictures and he's in them and he's in all of them. And then there's some that were supposed to have the black cat in them, but the black cat's been cut out, <laughs> you know? And it's like, you know, she's like, what the hell is she doing with all these pictures? You know what? She was, uh, she, was she doing something studying me or, or doing a report on me or something? And it's like a fan. Well, well yeah, like yeah. It's are. like, no, she, she, if she, if that was it, she would have, uh, she have just kept that file in her office. She wouldn't have had it. I'd forgotten and, about this reference to the kid who collects. Yep. And Spider-Man. he makes a reference. I haven't seen so many clippings since that dying little boy's collection. Yeah. And then he figures it out. And it was something that, you know, again, this is, didn't just come up. Bill Mantlow had, had laid, had laid the groundwork for this, uh, by, you know, showing us Gene's thoughts and that Gene was, deve- was becoming infatuated with Spider-Man. Uh, and, uh, it just breaks his heart. It's like, she liked me. Uh, he's like, I had no idea, no idea at all. You know, it's like, well, why didn't she say anything? We could have, well, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. Could have, would have, should have. And it's a shame. I mean, that might've made for some interesting stories, but uh, you know, I, I always thought that uh, in fact, I wrote about it in my uh, Mary Jane series that I wrote ages ago. Jean probably was in love with Spider-Man, but she probably wouldn't have had much use for Peter Parker. Uh, I, I would say she wouldn't be shallow like the black cat. But, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I think that, uh, Peter Parker, uh, she wouldn't have liked that personality too much. Um, yeah. cause you know, she was driven and ambitious and everything. And as Spider-Man, you know, he's one way, but as Peter Parker, he's kind of lacking in the ambition and, and other things in his personal life. But anyway, mm-hmm. so we go to Gene's funeral and. We see the stepfather and the mother berating the stepfather because she's blaming him for Gene dying because she became a cop because of him. The stepfather is going to play a key moment later. That's why he's here. Uh, Matt Murdock is in the same cemetery at the judge's funeral. But, you know, Matt being Matt, here's the Sin Eater's heartbeat. The Sin Eater's here somewhere. Oh, and I, I, I forgot to mention that the part of the re- part of the talk Stan had with Peter was defining what Sin Eater was, what Sin Eater meant. And when I originally wrote like my top 10 Spider-Man, I made fun of it. It's like, oh, what's he do? Eat sins. Uh, but stupid me. Uh, it, it's based on uh, it's based on legends and and uh, traditions. And I think he specifically mentioned the Ozarks where a person dies. The food is, you know, food is laid on him. That represents, you know, his sins. Someone comes and eats him and essentially cleanses that person's soul. So that's what the scene here is. Anyway, uh, so so then we find out as everybody's breaking up, breaking apart, that uh, Jonah is going to be leaving town for a while. Uh, he and he and Ned, uh, soon to be dead Ned, uh, and um are going to Florida for a distributors convention and Marla's going to be by herself. And, uh, you know, P, you know, he, Jonas says, you know, Peter just, you know, could you just like, you know, keep an eye on Marla? Uh, I don't like leaving her alone. Um, well, we go to the priest again, the priest that we've seen a couple other times, but this time we clearly see the sin eater. 
You know, it's not the guy, it's not somebody with glasses, it's clearly the sin eater. And here we go. We get another, we get another bam, we get another uh explosive uh cliffhanger, and thus ends uh part two of the death of Gene DeWolf. Makes makes you want to pick up the next one, which Absolutely. is a job. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so got, uh, the next oh. one, which is spec one Oh nine, which is right yep. here. Who is without he, who is without sin. So, yep. you know, anyway, we, um, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, we pick up with the media reports talking about the priest's murder. Uh, and then we have a very key scene where Marla is calling Marla Madison is calling up, uh, Betty Brandt. And saying, hey, you know, since both of our husbands are out of town, why don't we get together and party? Wild and crazy times. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, why don't, why don't they get together? Uh, and then now there's a subplot here that gets paid off later about Santa Claus who's stealing things. It, it's not relevant. It's not relevant. It's it not. pays off. It's, it's, it's not part relevant to this story. Um, Spider-Man pays a visit to the Kingpin because, you know, you know, he want you know is it like he, he's trying to dig up dirt? He wants to see if he knows anything about the sin eater. Kingpin doesn't, um, and uh, you know basically says that you know he would you know he just while he doesn't you know he doesn't like honest cops and judges. He doesn't like to see him blown away either because that makes things unstable and he likes control. But so anyway, he said, "Why don't you do just what Daredevil did? Daredevil didn't knock o- knock o- out all my guards coming in. He just walked through the front door." Um, <laughs> so. And I don't know if the Kingpin knows who Daredevil is at this time or not, but uh, anyway. Um, no, that was, I, I don't know. I, I think that was at the end of Miller's. I could be wrong. Um, but anyway, so so Matt Murdock decides as Matt Murdock to go, you know, go to bars and start ask, <laughs> asking for information about the scene eater. Uh, and of course, your typical bar patrons wanting to pick a fight, you know, and, and then Spider-Man, he leaves and then Spider-Man crashes through the window uh, trying to find it, figure out, find the same thing. And nobody knows anything. So so the next few pages is Spider-Man trying to, um, uh, um, you know, try, trying to shake some information out of informants, you know, and he latches on to one of his informants. Uh, and he thinks that uh, he thinks that by, um, you know, yell, you know, talking loudly about, hey, you know, uh, we're good friends, aren't we? We get together like this all the time that he's going to scare this informant so badly that you know, he'll, he'll give up, he'll give up information on the sand eater. Well, it turns out, it turns out that the guy doesn't know anything. He's just a low life informant. And, you know, maybe Spidey kind of overstepped his, you know, but Spider-Man is not thinking rationally. He's very, you know, it's very personal. This whole murder is very personal to him. So he's, um, he's uh, not thinking clearly. Well, and next we go to the daily bugle and oh, you, you were talking about this little girl. I love this line. Hey, daddy. There's a man here with a bug on his chest. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> no, I no, think no. that's pretty. But it is cool. Yeah, it's a decent scene. That's but, uh, you know, he, but so we go to the Daily Bugle and this actually is one of the most significant. This is a very significant scene in Spider-Man history. It is. Um, it is. Very significant. Although not for the reason, though you have absolutely none of us had any idea at the time. And I know that Peter David didn't. Uh, no. Didn't think it was going to be significant, but David Michelinie picked up on it. Um, the Sin Eater is coming after J. Jonah Jameson yep. uh, because, he, you know, he thinks he's a bleeding heart. The Sin Eater essentially wants to kill people he thinks are soft on crime. Uh, so he wants to, uh, uh, you know, he wants to blow away Jonah. Uh, Jonah's not there. And, uh, you know, Jonah, uh, he uh, he threatened, uh, Sin Eater threatens Marla. Uh, Robbie kind of tries to talk him down peter realizes that there's he, he doesn't have time to do anything so he's so he, uh he's not going he's he can't change the spider-man so he literally like pits picks out the roller of the typewriter <laughs> and beans the sin uh, beans the sin eater with it like, he, uh, like he's bullseye <laughs> yeah um so then we find out the sin eater is unmasked and it turns out it's this emo greco character okay so that's who we think the sin eater is Okay, now boys and girls, and I know you. Lo- I know Hornacek knows. Uh, <laughs> so I you know I don't even know what you know. It's like I could have Hornacek just get on here and explain it to everybody why it's so significant. But the reason it's significant is because as we we find out in Amazing Spider-Man number three hundred, this Emil, this Emil Greco confessed that he was a sin eater to Eddie Brock. Yeah. Uh, 
And then Eddie Brock, of course, you know, published it. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, then Spider-Man caught the real Sin Eater. And therefore, Eddie blamed Spider-Man for everything that went wrong in his life <laughs> after that. No, you didn't say anything, Hornacek, but you've been here long enough. We know how you <laughs> think. Also, Vinkman, Vinkman tells us it was in Born Again. Born Again. Uh, so that was after Miller left and came back. Like that's oh, I don't shout know out what to, came first. Uh, Vinkman, help me out. What came first, this or Born Again? I think it's about the same time. I could be wrong. Uh, a shout out to Vinkman in responding in in, in the notes to uh, which I try to read the notes, boys and girls, but I can't read it during the show. Uh, last month when we were talking about whether people use film and cameras, Vinkman said that uh, in photography school that photographers are still photographers are still taught how to use and develop film. So anyway, thank you, Vickman. But anyway, um, so we think this Emil Greco, this this worthless person here, is uh, the Saint Eater. Eddie Brock obviously did too, uh, you know. As poor, but poor Eddie's gonna, uh, uh, his life's gonna get turned around because of that. Um, anyway, um, Daredevil walks in, and uh, Dare, you know, because you know, Daredevil's gonna wants to know if this guy's really the Saint Eater. Wants to confront him. Now, of course, as we know, Daredevil hears heartbeats. Daredevil Ooh, remembers boom. heartbeats. This guy, he has heard the Sin Eater's heartbeat, and this is not the Sin Eater. So, you know, he, uh, you know, he he drags Spider, you know, says Spider-Man. Uh, so, you know, he basically says that, um, you know, this this guy's not the Sin Eater, I know. And, of course, since they don't, he, you know, Peter doesn't know he's Matt, you know, Murdoch or whatever, he can't say, yeah, I recognize his heartbeat. Uh, but then Daredevil starts chastising him for the uh, uh, heavy handedness uh, in treating the informant um, that the informant, you know, wound up giving up a lot of other information because Spider-Man had scared him so much uh, that he gave up information so that he could go into wit either witness protection or he could get protection. And, and, Dare and Daredevil was telling Spider-Man that you crossed the line. You, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Um, and. Um, then they, um, they, um, so anyway, so they, they know where, you know, Daredevil knows where Greco lives. And, uh, so, so they go there. Uh, but, uh, it turns out that, um, the story is locked must be to the net. Oh, okay. So they go to Greco's and, uh, the door is locked. So they just decide so I go, Oh, maybe it's the other door. So they go to the door the next, which it's like, well, no, I mean, I'm thinking if these are apartments, there's only going to be one way in, right? <laughs> but um, so uh, let's just go to the other door. Oh, this is this is open. Let's, so let's walk in. Um, well, they find out it's Stan Carter's apartment yeah. or Craig T. Nelson's apartment. And yeah. there it is. The keys to the kingdom. You know, the ant, the solution to everything. Stan Carter is clearly the sin eater. Yep. Uh, and uh, they and uh, of course, now that. <clears throat> now that they know that Greco's not the Sin Eater, that the Sin Eater is Carter, and that Carter is still out there, and that Jonah was uh, Carter's target, that or was probably going to be Carter's target, um, because what they're doing, because, because well, because Daredevil, uh, for, I forgot this part, the voices that Greco claimed he was hearing, and why he confessed to being the Sin Eater and thinking he was a Sin Eater is because he was listening. I guess the walls were thin in that apartment and he was listening to Carter's delusional ramblings about being the sin eater. So he <laughs> thought he was the sin eater. Right. Uh, and so now that, uh, so um, Spidey realizes that Carter, Carter was going to go after Jonah as well. Jonah's not home, but Betty and Marla are there. And, you know, Spider-Man, uh, um, so, you know, Spider-Man decides to go to Jonah's and says, if that monster hurts them, you know, Betty and Marla hurts anyone, I'll kill him. Yeah. So leave it too. Yeah. So, the, you know, and, and there's already been a little bit of conflict between Spider-Man and Daredevil about the law and about the limits of the law. Yeah. So, you know, so we always, we, we, we've had that. And then one of the greatest cliffhangers in Spider-Man Oh, it history. was, boy. One of the greatest cliffhangers in Spider-Man history. Betty is talking on the... Peter or Peter calls Betty, trying to warn her to watch out. And But uh, he's a little too slow, and the Sin Eater's a little too quick on the draw. And part three ends how? With a blam. Blam! Boom! Boom! 
Now, roll credits. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Oof. Unfortunately, over time, you know, death and comics doesn't have any meaning anymore. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's like even people without superpowers now are coming back from the dead or we find out that they really did have super like Ned. We find out, oh, he really did have superpowers. They just kicked in later, you know, and brought him back to life. So um, so it, so after Gene was killed, <clears throat> you know, and Betty was a minor character. Really, you thought there was a possibility. Mean, you didn't think they were probably going to kill her off, but really there was a distinct possibility that she yeah. had been murdered. So yeah, you really are wait thinking 30 days. To there's find a out. possibility. Yeah. So you're waiting 30 days. And yeah. so anyway, so Spidey is swinging. I mean, he's making, he's, picked. he's making time, you know, and uh, Daredevil's trying, trying to keep up with him. And Peter is remembering that, you know, you know, yeah, he's, he's had more serious relationships and, you know, since then, but the first girl he truly fell in love with was Betty Brandt. You know, and her in the bugle office. You know, and it's and it's like you know, Scotty told Captain Picard. You know, <laughs> uh, in uh, Star Trek Relics, you know, season six, episode four. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> like it, it's like the first time you fall in love. You never quite love a woman like that again. It doesn't mean that you don't find somebody you love more or find somebody, you know. But the first time you fall in love is it, it, it it's it's you remember it all your life it's just very special very different um i don't, I don't in, know if all issues end with a blam is they did true? they did they, they all issues, blams, huh? all ended with a blam i'll be but it all turns right. out turns out betty's pretty darn quick. betty was a qu little quicker than we gave her credit for <laughs> she's under the desk a little quicker than we gave i guess she was used to i guess she was so fast uh, getting under the desk because she'd hide from probably hiding from Jonah, right? She hear Jonah about to come in or out, and boom, you know, she disappear. Uh, so that's probably why she's so quick. But well, tch, Sin Eater says, you know, okay, I'm, I missed you the first time. Uh, I'll get you now. Uh, and uh, you know, so we get the Sin Eater's motives that he uh, he caught, you know, that he was after people who caught criminals, but he killed G Gene De Wolf because he felt like it and we find out later why uh but uh so betty stabs him with the letter opener uh which gives her just enough of a, of a respite Man, for look at him call her a slut oh dang yep well yeah he's a super villain he's an evil Ooh. super crazy crazy super villain who's who not once but twice now has had I mean, uh, not to get dirty here, but, you know, the almost orgasmic thrill of murder, you know, Arnage he's, has Cletus Cassidy has similar tastes. Yeah, he's had that. So he's had that ripped from him twice now. So, yeah, he's he's really probably juiced. Unfortunately for him, he's going to run meet somebody who's even more juiced than he is. Yeah. And I, again, one of the great this is what happens when spider-man does not hold back you don't have for the most part you know unless you're somebody in the really high powered class uh you don't have much of it he's going to take a do with a shotgun out pretty darn quick yeah he's <laughs> uh and he's going to enjoy it too yeah. uh so you know he breaks <laughs> he <laughs> breaks the double barrel shotgun uh over his knee and then he's just he has he's fun. literally he nothing is going to stop him he is going to beat him to death um, and that's fine. It's fine with me. I couldn't care, <laughs> but you know, daredevil comes in being the little weenie wussy liberal, you know, that he oh, is. <laughs> there well, you go. No. Yeah. But All I mean, right. no, I mean, it's like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I, as I've gotten older, I've become much more liberal and moderate on a lot of things, but law and order is not one of them. All right. Uh, so daredevil and, comes in and ruins everything, calm down, ruins yeah. everything. You know, uh, because he, Carter Carter, punches him out the window. Boom. Yeah. And see, and then this is where I, I say, oh, you know, give me a break. You know, so Spider-Man's just really mad. So Daredevil decides, yeah, I'm going to taunt this really hyped up super being, you know. Um, and so so by needling Spidey and being, you know, doing quick daredevil -y things, he's able <laughs> to get... He's able to catch Spider. I mean, you know, Spider Man's sloppy. He's able to catch him off guard, and then he's able to momentarily, you know, uh, I wouldn't say knock him out, but just knock him senseless for a little bit. No, 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 never, no. 
Well, they got to end the story somehow, Jr. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, Spider Man would have connected with Daredevil's face, and Matt Murdock would have had some extensive orthodontic bills. <laughs> no reason, no reason Daredevil should be able to hold his own against Spider Man. Yeah. So anyway, but you know, okay, so now you know, but but Carter ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you know, he ain't just getting up and walking away like he's done the last few times. He gets arrested, uh, and. Um, so Peter, um, well, yeah, anyway, so Peter goes to the bugle, checks in with Jonah, and then and then people are doing the man on the street, you know, uh, the journalists are doing the man on the street interviews. Oh, yeah, Peter calls that man. That man's really worried because Ernie Popchick left the house with a gun, you know, so, so, um, but, uh, you know, the, the fact that Carter now has, is revealed or the city is revealed to be a cop, uh, a lot of the media are, and people are saying, oh, you can't trust anybody anymore. You know, now the cops are killers, too. We don't feel safe. Don't feel safe with the crooks. Don't feel safe with the cops. Uh. Um, and then, you know, we find and then we, we come across Mr. Popchick, who, you know, uh, pulls a Bernard gets. Now, I don't know. Maybe Hornacek knows. <laughs> um, but uh I don't know if you remember Bernie Getz, but this is exactly what happened. This is There's a subway thing. I, literally I ripped the right. subway vigilante ripped from the headlines. Uh, a bunch of punks approached uh, 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 an electrician by the name of Bernard Getz, who just happened to be armed. Uh, and he took them all out. Um, and, uh, but uh, so that, you know, so Ernie pop chick takes these guys out and, um, and, and then do we, we ever get, hear from Ernie Popchick again? <laughs> I think we do. I think we do. I mean, I it's, know. it's, we heard, I mean, there was um, all those, you know, we, we also heard from Mr. Chekhov too. That was another, uh, another uh, uh, tenant. There was a guy by the name of Mr. Chekhov. Um, and then like, well, one issue when Spider-Man, you know, is saving people in the house. How did you know my name? Oh, I'm a big Star Trek fan. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we find out Stan's origin and, and that and when Stan Carter was a, uh, member of shield uh that they were trying to see if they could create superpowered agents and the uh let's see i want to get this right here because i think they do say that what the serum they gave him uh was laced with ls pcp yeah um gain for, so and you know, I mean, it, it, every, all of us who watch the first Terminator movie knows uh, that, uh, you know, if you're high on PCP, you know, you probably can't are strong enough to smash through a window, but you've broken, you know, every bone in your hand, according to Lax Henderson telling Linda Hamilton that about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. Terminator 1, folks, 1984, directed by James Cameron. Anyway, so we find out that, you know, but unfortunately, the discontinuing of the program and the effect the drugs had stand, on Stan's mind started driving him bonkers he got left shield uh and he was doing fine for a while but then after the death of his partner he started going off the deep end and that's when he became the civic eater so anyway stan's going to show up for an arraignment but there's a mob ready for him the mob that wants to hang him yeah you know they you know are um want to exact their pound of flesh how did we get to pcp <laughs> Well, that no, it's it is mentioned in there. It's, uh, it's in there. I, it's, I'm trying it, to it, find the panel. It, yeah, it's in there. Uh, certainly, Mister. So the, one of the somebody's explaining to the district attorney about Shield that Stan was in research and development, uh, and the district attorney goes, "Well, R and D what? Uh, the extraordinary strength gained from such drugs, such as PCP or Angel Dust. Users reportedly become unstoppable, unstoppable juggernauts." juggernauts in some instances stan and several others were injected with modifications of pcp to see if it could be used safely um and anyway but and, and so like i was making that terminator reference because uh when linda hamilton's character tells lance hendrickson you know that well this guy has to be a super powered being a robot whatever because i saw him smash you know smash his hand through a window and and Lance Henderson explains why he was probably hopped up on the PCP. So anyway, so Peter Parker is as Spider-Man is snapping pictures of Sam's of, of uh, Stan's arraignment. Uh, and uh, then Daredevil pops in. And um, anyway, Daredevil is not very happy. I mean, Spider-Man is not happy with Daredevil for, you know, for uh, knocking him around uh, for and for stopping him from, you know, 
the center, you know, what uh, cleaning Stan's clock, you know, and of course, you know, the daredevil was like, what, what, you, you know, killing him, what, you were going to kill him. And you think that's justice. You think the mob, this mob goes after him, that that's justice too. You know, and of course, Spider-Man, like the normal person says, yeah, why the hell not? Uh, and then it happens, you know, Stan's being led out uh, to the paddy wagon. And uh, uh, the mob, which is, happens to be led by Gene's stepfather, there's where the stepfather comes in. Although in this panel, the stepfather has dark hair other than blonde hair, which as it, it was colored in the other issues. And then we get one of the classic moments in Spider-Man that was unfortunately undone with the mind wipe. You know, and, and, and it's like, again, you know, one more day in the mind wipe. And it's like, what a lazy, what a, an idiotic, lazy storytelling device that negates a lot of other good stories and a lot of other good moments. And this was one of them uh, where Daredevil tries to, you know, basically stop Carter from getting murdered by this mob. Uh, and uh, Spider-Man is just going to sit and fuck. I, I mean, not shit crap. I ain't going to do anything, you know, <laughs> let him beat him to death. But then Daredevil starts to be overwhelmed because they all, the, the crowd begins to over, you know, he's getting too many signals and uh, he can't handle the crowd by himself. Spider-Man's just content to stand there, you know, and Daredevil keeps yelling, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, you know, and, you know, Spider-Man's saying, nope, nope, not hearing nothing, not seeing nothing, you know, do 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 and then he hears it, Peter, yep. and it went and yell his ID, <laughs> he did, <laughs> yep. and uh, that snaps him, Spider-Man out of it, uh, and, uh, you know, Daredevil says, I'm, you know, he rescues Daredevil and he stops the crowd from killing Stan. You know, he said, you know, basically, oh, and Stan's dad is b blonde again <laughs> in, <laughs> in the next when his hands are around Stan Carter's throat. He's blonde again. Blonde again. Um, yeah. But he the page before uh, he was uh, 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 dark haired, yeah. uh, kind of like the time Mary Jane was blonde in two panels in the first part of Maximum Carnage. But anyway, so Spider-Man rescues Daredevil, you know, and uh so he goes and Daredevil says, I'm sorry, I had to do that, but I had to get through to you. The situation was so desperate, yeah. you know, and uh, Spider-Man goes, so Peter, huh? And, uh, and Daredevil goes, yeah, and, uh, you know, just so we're square, uh, my name's Matt Burdock, you know. <laughs> so... So now so those two is, become kind of buddies. A they, bit. they become good. They become decent friends. I mean, they still Absolutely. have, they, um, you know, the, the, they have different pers And this was a, it was a friendship. I liked is it, it was a different friendship. For example, they had Spider-Man and the human torch Spider-Man, Peter and Johnny storm were buddies because they were both the same age, uh, yeah. kind of had the same amount. I mean, of course, Johnny was, <laughs> amped up but you know they both kind of had the same kind of exuberance and recklessness and you know i mean they were buddies you know they they you know they, they were the type of guys you know you'd sit you know have a beer talk about girls you know yeah. murdoch the, the friendship with uh, peter and my and murdoch was more maybe one of a professional level of professional respect where you know that you, you didn't say and talk around the personal things but you kind of talked about uh the nuances of your identity and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, it was a good, and Murdoch was always more serious than Peter. So basically they, you know, we find out that Ernie pop chick is going to go to, you know, needs a lawyer. Aunt May can't afford one. Uh, uh, Matt says that, you know, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll get him. I'll find him a, a lawyer. They'll do it pro bono. And uh, basically Matt is saying, look, Peter, just give the system a chance. Okay. It's not perfect, but let's just give it, let's give the system a chance to work. Peter says, I'll think about it. And then boom, boom, the end. Um, right. Doesn't get much better than this, folks. You know, yeah. it was a, and it was, it was told in four issues and it was done. There's not a lot of waste. There's not any waste in it. There's no padding. Um, P A D padding. Uh, see what I did there. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's a, it's a great story. Uh, it was a significant story. Uh, and it's just a shame that, uh, and, and, and there was, there were actually a sequel to this, which there, uh, were Stan there's Carter. a couple. Yeah. Stan Carter, the best one though, the, the one that Nick Spencer did, I, I honestly didn't care for, but that I'll get that in a second. The next one, Peter David did about 20 odd issues later that Carter was, you know, I, I he was decided, they decided he was in his right mind. You know, he, he was a sin here when he was insane. He got the drugs flushed out of the system. Yeah. Uh, so now he's sane and he got released. Uh, and, um, 
of course, um, yeah. oh, but, 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 you know, of course, Spider-Man doesn't understand this, but, but the point that Peter David, you know, and I saw this in an interview, Peter David said, well, what would, um, you know, what would the effect on a person be if they were brutally beaten by somebody like Spider-Man, you know, even with augment, some augmentation, uh, Carter had no chance against Spider-Man. So, so basically when, when Spider-Man goes to confront Carter after he's been released, Carter's a wreck. He's, he's limping. He's, he, he, he had to have dental surgery. His eardrums were shattered. I mean, he's a wreck of a man and it's Spider-Man's doing. Uh, and then, you know, Carter tries to reenter. It is, it is actually a good story because Peter David, while having sympathy for Carter, does not excuse anything he did. He's still guilty of what he did. Uh, but Carter can't reintegrate in the society. He b- apparently becomes a sin eater again and uh, basically, though, does suicide by cop. Um, but then it, Nick Spencer, oh, sorry, Nick Spencer oh, no, brings him. Yeah, Nick Spencer brings him back because, <laughs> because I guess what we thought was and honestly what was Harry Osborne's name? Kindred. Kindred. Uh, <laughs> when the Kindred story was good, Kindred brings Sinier back to, you know, take away people's sins literally, uh, and he thinks that as a result of his soul getting dragged back from hell and him doing what Kindred wants him to do, that he's going to be redeemed. And he shoots Norman Osborne and takes Norman sins away. And, you know, which is a subplot that has run through still going, still going. But the, the, the twist here was that Kindred tells Stan that you're still going back to hell. And uh, he goes, why I did I repented. I did what you asked or whatever, because you're the one who murdered your partner because you were doing, and I forget you were doing something, your partner found out and you killed him. So that's why, you're yeah. going, still going to hell. Personally, I don't like that. I, 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 I think that was unnecessary. And I mean, so, I, so we got that. We got uh, this story affects so many different things in the spider history. It affects the cre- whoop, the, cre- uh, the creation of Venom, right? Yep. The Eddie, Eddie Brock. And someone in chat mentioned this story is never mentioned in any media of the creation of Venom. They never talk about the Sin Eater at all. But well, it's, a, it's, it's one it, of those it, things that it's hard to sound bite. Um, it is, it you is. know, because, because really it was this event that was done in isolation. Another writer took it and used it as the motivation for another character who, who we never heard of at the time, Eddie Brock. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's probably, if you were actually to tell the story to a, nor- a normie, as we call them, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, a normie it, Osborne, well, um, it probably would be, uh, uh, so it affected uh, Venom. It affected Norman Osborn with his sins, who is still currently mm-hmm. being in play. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it affected one more day in the fact that this was erased because the, the friendship was erased. I don't think Daredevil at the moment knows who Peter Parker is, I think. I think it's still nearly 20 years later. I don't think they've come back and... and back well, I, I Spider-Man hasn't had... And I'm trying to think, well, Nick spent Nick's I've like, I always said, I'm very uh, up and down about Nick Spencer. He does. He obviously knew Spider-Man, obviously yeah. knew Spider-Man. Uh, but the stories he told, I, I don't know if it was all editorial or what, but they were overlong and bloated. Uh, that's, but, I, that's, that seems to be the case. Still the yeah. gang war. Look at that. It, it, it may not just be Nick Spencer. I think it's Marvel mandates. Yeah, had but, things but out. he was really, but he was literally, but he was building to what we were hoping was a great resolution. Couple of comments that I pinned that I want to show up here. Um, there were actually two police officers in the spectacular Spider-Man cartoon, and their names are Gene DeWolf and Stan Carter. They show up frequently in the series, so it shows that that Greg Weissman cartoon was actually hinting that uh, they may touch on that if they had more seasons. So I thought that was kind of a neat. Or, you know, but Greg Wiseman knew Spider-Man. Uh, so yeah, yeah there's, there's, yeah. He's coming back to then, write right. spectacular Spider-Man with Spidey and Miles Morales. If you like Greg Wiseman, he's coming back to the print. Yeah. He uh, knew Horn- Spider-Man. Hornacek had a good comment about how Peter David says in the trade paperback of the story that he gave Carter the name Stan to make the readers like him more since the Spidey readers, they're predisposed to like someone named Stan. So that was an interesting comment. That's uh, that's 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 quite an assumption. Uh, 
I don't know. Maybe maybe there's some uh, uh, St. Louis Cardinal fans out there that remem- fondly remember Stan Musial. But no, no. Uh, remember in the front of every Marvel comic at this time, Stanley presents. That's true. Spectacular Spider-Man. So Stan was in every book at the yeah. time. So. But you of all people should know who Stan Musial is. He's a St. Louis Cardinal legend. Yes, I know Stan the man. Okay, all right. Stan, Stan the, the man Musial or Stan the man Lee. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Also, I want to talk about before we wrap that. Well, any final thoughts on this, this four part of JR? No, I mean, I think I, you no. know, and, uh, you know, it, uh, folks, if, I mean, I'm sure most everybody in the, in the chat room has read it, but, uh, you know, I, I, it holds up. I mean, the story is what going on 40 years old now. It is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next year will know, be its 40th anniversary. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. And, and like, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I picked up part four. I just, I just burnt was my intention was just to burn, steal it, you know, but I was so gripped by it and the resolution that I bought it, <laughs> you know, oh. be, you know, broke college student, you know, I had to fork over, uh, 65 cents. Five cents. My God, man. Jeez. You know, it wasn't made crazy. out of money. My guy, you know, um, real quick before we wrap it up, I want to remind people, about the Peter David fund who wrote this story, who wrote this amazing story. I refreshed it. it he's gone up a thousand dollars, uh, since we started this broadcast. So, uh, please, if you'd like to help out one of the best Spider-Man writers, in my opinion, of all time and JR's, uh, log on to gofundme.com slash Peter hyphen David hyphen, uh, fund. Uh, and they have an update as of yesterday that he's slowly getting better. And they even have a picture of Peter David, uh, right there getting better. So, yeah. But I uh, strokes, strokes and a heart attack. And yeah, poor guy. I mean, I, I don't know what his quality of life is going to be. That, yeah. I mean, but that's, that's he has amazing. another, uh, Spidey mini coming out called symbiote Spider-Man 2099 coming out this year. The solicits have come out. So, hmm. uh, I'll be damned. Check that out. His, um, last mini that he wrote, uh, the Joe fix it with the Hulk and Spidey in Vegas was amazing. If you like Peter David stuff, that was really, really good. Didn't so, it, who, who, but who was the one who wrote the, uh, the new fantastic four? What was that? That was him. That wasn't as good, but yeah, the Joe that, fixed was, it one was real good. Okay. Real good. Cause I was, I was really disappointed with that. Uh, I was new fantastic four one. I so. was too. All right. Uh, right. We will be back in just a few minutes for another episode. Thanks for watching. Everybody. <laughs>